Lecture number 17. Stay close with me now. I'm going to go fast. I have a lot of ground to cover here. Just want to hit a few high points. Who was the first king of the Mulekites who was descendant of Nephi? Which Mosiah? Mosiah the first. What was his son's name? What was his son's name? And Mosiah the second will be the very last king of the Nephites. You don't know that yet, but he's, he's the last of the kings. After 500 years of kings, he'll be the last. Now, the best record of ideal kings in all history, whether secular or religious, is in this Book of Mormon of these three kings. Samuel wrote a book that was given him by God, which described how you could be a good king if the people insisted on a king to replace the priesthood government. And Israel did insist upon it, therefore Samuel wrote up a book for kings. We do not have it. The closest we have is the lives of these men who may have had that book in their um, um, brass plates. Anyway, what would they charge taxes for under Benjamin? Were there taxes? No. Wait a minute. Yeah. There were taxes, but not for what? Not for the support of the king, which is always more expensive than just making roads. You've got roads, you've got water supply, you've got fuel, you have a number of things you have to have taxes for that are perfectly legitimate. But not to support a bureaucracy. If you were called to serve in the government and so forth, it was a great calling of honor. As Brigham Young used to say, you ought to be able to earn a living in about a third of your time, about a third of your waking hours, when you're full of out of school and you've been out of, this is true, you can do it. About a third of your time, he said, should be devoted to the church and the kingdom and your family and about, uh, and you divide the rest between community service and taking care of your neighbors and helping one another and, and being, being a good guy, so to speak. Um, it's kind of an interesting philosophy of life. Uh, most people have their lives unbalanced. They spend 99% uh, of their time earning a living and one-tenth of one percent goes to their family. None goes to the community and none goes to their neighbors and whatever's left over goes to the kingdom. It's real uh, tight. But we're spreading it out now. Your generation's much better balanced, much better balanced. I see, uh, I see a maturity in you that wasn't in the classes 10 years ago. So I have great hope for you. That's why I chastise you when you get behind, because you've got a great future. I just want you to uh, muff it. All right, now, when you're in the service of your fellow men or one another, what are you in? Isn't that great? You're serving God. You say, well, i got to go to my meeting. Uh, of course, this lady's car is stalled, and she's 90 years old. But uh, I don't want to be late for my meeting. Which comes first? People. People. This is what President Lee keeps emphasizing. Nothing's more important than people. He says to the uh, stake presidents and bishops, are you neglecting your families? Your ward isn't more important than your families. Your family comes first. You have to take care of your family. Ward's important, but not that important. Uh, it's hard to keep that in perspective sometimes. And I, I want to tell you it's hard. I want you just to remember this as you get these responsibilities. Your children, your wife, your loved ones, number one in your stewardship. All right? Now I have to tell you how he eliminated crime and injustice. The whole book of the Republic by Plato has one objective, and that's to eliminate injustice in a society. Do you know how Plato said to do it? With a dictatorship. You get in charge of the people and all their resources and force the stupid masses to do what's good for them. Marx copied it, Hitler copied it, Tojo copied it, Mussolini copied it, and every one of them exploded internally. You can only impose a dictatorship on a people so long, and it does not provide justice. And you've got a little handful of people saying, we'll decide what's good for you, and they just aren't that smart. They try to play God, and as a result, they get a revolution. Now let me tell you how what really works. In a Zion society, you see, this was a lot of material you may not have had time to read, but some of the most, uh, the, one of the principal breakthroughs in this entire volume is that material that was on the law of the covenant. And when you, some of you become lawyers, come back to this. This is God's revealed pattern for justice. And when I was sitting in a law school, I heard a professor say, one of the most vengeful, archaic, 
primitive, barbarian methods of trying to achieve justice was the one that Moses claimed God gave him. I'm a return missionary boy. Did I pop, sit up straight in the back of that class and get out my pencil and start taking notes? What's this professor talking about? He said, if you can imagine, a couple of fellows get in a fight and you actually claw a man's eye out. They arrest you and claw your eye out. You got two half-blind men wandering around town. I said to myself, you know, that doesn't sound like God to me. Someday I'm going to take out two or three or four years and really study the law of God and see what was really behind it. All right, I finally got the chance. There were no books on it, in or out of the church. Everybody was taking that primitive approach to a beautiful law, and nobody had searched out the key that I had access to. I later learned that there had been a breakthrough here and there, but uh, it never got any publicity. Uh, they didn't write books or something. They just tucked it away in a thesis and forgot it. So, here's what we found actually happened. If I, if you and I get in a, in a hustle and... You're, you've got more muscle, and I, I, I'm not winning, you see, so I, I give a little of this. And uh, ooh, all of a sudden, soft, and he goes out, and, and that's it. And you're screaming with pain and so forth. And, and uh, let's say maybe it was a mugging job. I kind of uh, caught you going by, a dark alley, so far, and down, and so forth. And you resist. You're not supposed to, but you do. You resist. And so Meanwhile, one goes out. And so I run. But with your one eye, good eye, you say, that's Brother Scousen. I know I'm boys, Brother Scousen. So I'm hauled into court. Now, the first thing that's interesting are the judges. The judges are servants of God. They know, owe nothing to you and nothing to me, but they owe to God the establishment of equity between us. And so I'm convicted. And so I finally confess. And so I throw myself on the mercy of the court. They say, well, Brother Scousen, which is your best eye? Well, in 2020, right eye. And uh, so they say, how much is it worth to you? Well, quite a bit. I look down at the hot iron, you see, that they put eyes out with, or the glancing needle. And I said, well, quite a bit. How much? And I say, uh, well, a lot. Five thousand. Five thousand dollars. They turn to you and say, is five thousand enough? And you're a good fellow Israelite. You say, no, no, that's not enough. <laughs> I am an accountant. I earn my living with my eyes. And since I lost my eye, I, it's very difficult to adjust with one eye. My whole livelihood is in jeopardy. I will do it cheap. Twenty-five thousand. <laughs> Now, that's the way it starts. They turn to me and they'll say, um, surely your eye must be worth a little more than that, Brother Scousen. Now, see, much depends upon my situation. If I am a millionaire, which I were, I'd be glad to give you a million, but if I'm a millionaire, you see, they make me establish a status of justice as between my condition and your condition. So if I'm a wealthy person, boy, I really put out. I really have to pay till it hurts because your eye hurt. We work it out. Let's say that we, I go up to 10,000, you came down to 17,500, and I finally got up to 12, and you came down to 15. Anyway, we settle at 13,500. Only problem is I don't have it. I'm glad to give you 13,500, but the reason, the reason of the mugging job, I didn't have any money, and I kind of wanted some money. I got a little plateau alcoholic problem, etc., and so forth, and I, uh, I wanted that money. So... Uh, the judge says, now, Brother Scousen, you have six years to pay this man back. Now, you can do it any way you want to. You can become a servant for him. You can become, you can, we'll put you under bond and you go out and work for somebody else. If I were you, I'd keep up the payments, however. And I look down at the hot iron, you see. And that. You don't hear about them putting out any eyes. Boy, what a motivator, right? What a motivator. Any of this money go to the judges? Not a penny. Who does it go to? My poor victim. This is the law not of lex talionis or revengeance, but the law of reparation. And I've been putting this in police magazines now for 13 years, and it's finally catching on. But some people don't know how to get justice. They... They decided that the victim needs something, so what did they do? They went to the poor taxpayer that didn't commit a crime 
and they're going to make the taxpayer pay for the victims. Well, this is ridiculous. I've been, and I've been criticizing them, that whole approach again, but it's sweeping the country. Make the victim pay. So the last three months, about 15 judges of record have started making the criminal pay his victim. It's catching on. And I'm going to preach it and teach it until we get that part of the law of justice that God gave in the law of the covenant back into the judicial and law enforcement field. Other people are picking it up now. That was a thrilling breakthrough. And how delighted I was to be able to go back to a couple of my law professors and say, you know, that law in the Old Testament didn't turn out to be so bad. It didn't turn out to be so bad. What do you mean? Every place it's been used, it was terrible. I said, and it wasn't used right. That's why it was terrible. So I told him about it. And then I found some rabbinical writings which showed that the interpretation we'd given was right. How do you think I found that breakthrough? How do you think I found the breakthrough? It was right in the Bible. It was right in the Bible. I found it in a statement by Moses where he said, and no damages, and let's see, and no damages in money shall ever be allowed for murder in the first degree or the shedding of innocent blood. That was my first hint. Aha! You can't pay for damages in money for murder. What about everything else then? See, that was my hint. And then I started looking, and here were three or four other passages, and I had it. And that was such a, a thrilling adventure in research, which absolutely repudiated what we had in our manuals. In fact, the Old Testament's the most neglected book in the church. We're just beginning to get studies on it. But anyway, it worked for King Benjamin. I want you to remember it. He had no slavery, had no murder. He said we, could, we knocked out adultery, immorality, theft. Why? Because we enforced the law strictly. What about an adultery? It says the adulterer, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. Right. Did they just automatically kill them? No. No, they had uh, the, in the uh, they have several possible remedies depending upon the situation. Uh, the death penalty uh, was imposed in quite a number of crimes. Be right with you in a minute. And the reason it was imposed was because that corrupted the whole society. Therefore, you repented and made up to the offended people the best that you could or you left or you were killed. Now by putting the death penalty on a lot of these it made it worthwhile for you to either repent and repair the damages to the best of your ability or be cut off from among the people. And how would that be achieved? You leave, you see. That left, that was a self-cleansing process. That's why you'll find Sabbath, regular Sabbath day breaking without repentance. Death penalty. Well, you know the Lord doesn't impose death for that, but he does impose exile. And so what he says is, if you're not going to repent and you're going to stay here and set a bad example for the youth and corrupt the Zion society, you remain at the risk of your life. See how that worked? So all through Leviticus, you keep getting, getting this, um, and he shall die or be cut off from among his people. And a lot of people thought they were synonymous. No, you either repent and do the best you can to make it up or... Get out of this community. You remain at the risk of your life. Right? 42nd section, section of the Doctrine and Covenants where, where adultery can be forgiven once. The next time it has to be completely, it, re, it requires, bishop has no alternative. It has to be excommunication. And if they subsequently can overcome and fight their way back and get over their immorality, good enough. But they, they have to start from scratch. They've lost all priesthood. They've lost membership. They have to start from scratch. The Lord considers that very serious. Now you see how a lot of these death penalties uh, apply? There's only one thing for which you cannot make reparation, and that's shedding innocent blood. You must sacrifice your own life in that case, for your own sake, because there's no forgiveness under the atonement for murder. That means deliberately lying in wake, and they, say, they call it shedding innocent blood, meaning if you weren't in a fight... You weren't, it wasn't some exciting situation. It wasn't in a war. You deliberately said, I'm going to lie and wait and kill him when he comes by. That's, called, that's shedding innocent blood. Unprovoked. All right? Yes? 
Uh, very good. Uh, that's also in your book. But uh, you'll get around to reading it in due time. Um, they, anything that's committed against the community, like breach of the peace, I mean, you, you, you offended everybody. Uh, drunken brawl, you know, every Saturday night, and they dry you out for 72 days, and then another 30 days, the fellow's back at it. He needs a little more motivation. And so they had the flat strap. If you couldn't pay in damages, you got the flat strap. Could not exceed 40 stripes, so the judges never gave you more than 39. And the flat strap was not designed to cut, but only to sting and bruise. The judge had to watch the administration of the stripes. If one of them brought blood, all the rest of the stripes were forgiven. So he had to watch them administered. Up in Canada, you can elect to take the strap instead of going to prison if it's a misdemeanor. A recent study showed that people who had elected to take the strap so they didn't lose their job and and could get on with life after they'd made their mistake, very seldom return to crime. Their recidivism rate is very low. Okay? Now, it's also permitted in Delaware, but never used. In Canada, it is used. But if it is used, it's because the person took that in the alternative, you see, from going to prison and wasting away six months of his life and losing his job, etc. Now, the next point that we want to be sure that you get the natural man is an enemy to God. Now this is all through the scriptures and I want you to understand why the natural man that was made by God is an enemy of God. The physical body was made as an instrument or a tabernacle for the spirit. It has built in self-survival instincts. It has no concept of morality. Everything that has been built into the intelligences of your body that is computerized to make it uh, uh, eat when it's hungry, sleep when it's sleepy, uh, grasp for that which it wants, which will satif satisfy some inward uh, proclivity, uh, 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 commit com criminal assault against a person of the opposite sex. All of these things are built in and their survival instincts. And they're all put in the DNA. They're built right into the DNA. So your spirit is given that body and told to make it fast, uh, make it take exercises, make it get up and go to the nine o'clock class, make it study when it wants to be entertained and laugh. It wants to be made to laugh and fritter away its time, you see. And you say, no, 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 no. You're going to sit down here and study, I think. And he says, well, I'm going to go to sleep on you. No, you stay awake. We're going to get this so far. See, you have a big talk with yourself. And uh, that's what this is. And when it says it's an enemy of God, it means it is opposed to the things of which the Spirit stands for. The Spirit says, you will be subject to me. The body says, I'm going to get what I want. I'm going to get it when I want it, how I want it, with what I want, etc., and the whole purpose of the second estate is to bring your body and all the intelligences in it under your control. It was given to you as a temple of God to bring under your control. You let it run you, and you'll be a criminal and a reprobate. You run it, and you can become a marvelous contribution to God's society, even a beloved of God called to be a saint. So big, uh, uh, Benjamin says, yield to the intestinings of the spirits, which says, fast, fast. Go on, go to priesthood meeting. Go to Relief Society. Now, you know it's supposed to be done. You know you always feel better after. <laughs> go to, get up now, get up. He says, that's, that's the enticings of the spirit. And it'll labor with you. It does with me. Regularly. Every morning at 4 a.m. Get the writing done. You know you've got to finish that. Get it going. Remember, got another semester coming. They're going to be expecting. It really agitates me. It's better, better than the alarm clock. This process of overcoming the body is called the what? Except ye are born of the water which makes your commitments and of the spirit which puts you in charge of your body and you, your spirit, subject to your heavenly father. Unless you go through that rebirth process of refinement, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. And as President Lee recently said, uh, to some of the missionaries, many of you ha have never been born again. And I want you to get now started for toward the rebirth. He said, I can tell when you're reborn again. You have a sweet spirit. You may be a real muscle man and a star in the 
uh, football player, uh, very aggressive by nature. But I can tell immediately when I meet you if you've overcome and are born again, have compassion for other people, uh, are merciful, a person of peace rather than war, full of fun and vigor and so forth, but not offensive, considerate of those who have less than you have, anxious to be helpful all the time, um, maybe uh, quick to uh, stir up in righteous indignation on occasion, but quick to put your arm around the individual and say it was for your love of them that you were angry at the moment over what they were doing, not because you hated them. All of this is part of a gospel pattern. It's a priesthood culture pattern. And President Lee said to the missionaries, a lot of you have never gotten on the trail of the new birth yet, and you probably don't even know what it is. So I'll tell you what it is. And he gave it to them, and he said, now be reborn again. Get your spirit in charge. Now then you get your sins blotted out, and they will not uh, cause you difficulty at the judgment. And this you must remember. At the judgment, your life is shown. Everything you ever did is shown for everybody to see unless you overcame it with repentance and the atonement. You'll be very grateful for the blackouts when that scene occurs. And your best friends and your family are going to say, uh, hey, where'd you go? Where'd you go? Oh, I'll be back. I'll be back. <laughs> and you're on the side, you say, thank you, Heavenly Father. I sure appreciate that. <laughs> Boy. Boy, what a scar that would have been. I wouldn't have been able to face my own children. if they. That was a silly, stupid thing of me. To, of course, I was only 15. My name was stupid. See, that's the way we're going to be. And we're all going to be very humbled because uh, we've all struggled with the forces of life. We've all struggled with temptation. Some of the time we've overcome it. Some of the time we've succumbed. We're all growing together. None of us are without our faults. Then, <clears throat> after Benjamin had told them about... Uh, all of these things and about the coming of Jesus Christ and the angel had told him that he had to tell the people certain things. In fact, the angel said, I, I'm told by the Father to tell you the following things and now I'm telling you. When he'd finished and Benjamin's related all of this, the people fall on the ground. Now, something very significant happens. They fall on the ground. Benjamin wants to know what's the problem. They said, we got sins. We got really, we really got sins uh, if you, now that you mention it. We got problems. Well, you dress nice, you look nice, you have a happy smile. I know, but <laughs> we have problems. Private, very serious private problems. Well, he said, let me tell you, if you have faith in God, and you'll repent of your sins that can be blotted out. Oh, they said, that's what we want. Oh, Heavenly Father, forgive us. And they're down on their knees and they're really pleading because uh, unbeknown, rippling under the surface, you've got a lot of evil going on here among these people. Not at any time did Benjamin tell them to be baptized. Why? They're all members of the church. They've been baptized. Would this kind of a sermon fit the saints today? It does indeed. And we got a president of the church that's coming out and, and, and doing a marvelous job getting this same kind of a message to the saints. So they plead with the Lord. Did something wonderful happen? All of a sudden, the richness. You see, you can have the Spirit of the Lord working with you all the time, subtly. But if it ever gives you that shock treatment, it is a glorious feeling. And if you've never experienced it yet, no amount of description will, will completely convey to you what it's like. But it's precious. And it only comes to us a few times in our lives, maybe only once or twice. But once you've felt it, it's something like this. It's a sense of magnificent weightlessness you actually feel as though you were lifted you feel that spirit make you warm in a very special way it's the most comforting wonderful thing that can happen to you now when it does happen stop and watch what's happening to you it usually won't last more than about five minutes and during that wonderful moment you may not be able to hold back the tears it's, it usually has a strong emotional impact. And you may just sit there weeping. And uh, you don't want anybody to speak to you. You don't want to be uh, disturbed in any way until it passes. And I want to testify to you that to have that blessing is one of the rich experiences of life. And it pays to try and live to enjoy it. Now, when it was passed... How did these people feel? 
How'd they feel? Relieved. Forgiven. They felt clean before the Lord. And when this happened to Enos, what did he say to the Lord? What did he say to the Lord? Yeah, how'd you do that? Oh, I feel so good. How'd you do that? How do you change me just that fast? Just a matter of minutes from my morbid, uh, beaten down, guilt-ridden feeling to this wonderful sense of almost childlike beauty and chastity, cleanliness. How did you do that? And he said, by the power of what? The atonement. This is made possible. And your belief in Christ made you eligible. Your anxiety made it uh, possible for me to grant you this great special blessing. So they had this spirit of peace. And then uh, Benjamin goes into the what's typical of a person who's been born again. And I've already covered it for you. They're peacemaking people. They... Uh, uh, one person will stand up and say, in a class, you you watch this kind of a person, and say, Brother Carlson, I don't see how that could be true. I know of a writing one of the prophets is just the opposite of what you said. So what you said must be wrong. Well, what's this called? What's this called? A spirit of contention or accusing spirit. And what is the word in, uh, in a Hebrew? The word devil comes from it. The accuser. Accuser. I don't want to debate. Now you watch a person who's born again will say, Brother Skousen, I'm, I'm interested in this point that you made here. Um, I was just wondering now, what did Brother Widso have in mind when he said so and so and so and so? And, and I may say, well, I don't think I remember him saying that. Shall I look it up and give it to you? I appreciate it if you'd comment on that. See, this may be helpful to me. It might give me, you know, it might expand my little window an extra couple of notches. Or there may be a, a complete explanation for it. Maybe we've got it all solved. Looks like a contradiction. It really isn't. You see how we, neither one of us lose face. We're able to dialogue. We talk to each other. Spirits who've bo been born again can be absolutely opposite in their position without contention as each one concedes that nobody knows everything about anything. And so they say to one another, but wouldn't this be a problem if we did that? And how would we handle this? See, that's so d much better than saying, that's impossible. You know we couldn't do this. You know we couldn't do that. That's impossible. That won't work. See how different it is? Now, in your classes, try to generate that spirit of brotherly inquiry of a person who has a different position than the one that you at the moment consider to be correct. Because he, you may turn out to be absolutely right and you need to help him. On the other hand, he may know something you don't know and you may turn out to be wrong. So you deal with each other's brethren. That's what it's talking about. Qualities of being born again. Now I want you to be sure and remember what it taught about the abominable rich and the abominable poor. What are the abominable rich? There's one word that describes them. Selfish, selfish, grabbing the money, people starving all around, means nothing, got mine, you see. That's the abominable rich. And God says they will go to hell just as sure as they're rich men if they're selfish. Membership in the church won't save them. And even if they pour out some of their wealth to the poor, if it was merely to salve a conscience and they exploited people and robbed the widow and the orphan and the employee in the process of getting it, the Lord says they will find themselves in hell. That's the abominable rich. Now who are the abominable poor? The abominable poor. The la yes. Yeah, the covetous, lazy poor are the abominable poor. They're covetous. They'll say, he's rich and I'm poor. Therefore, I, I'm entitled to it. The government ought to take it away from him and give it to me. That's the covetous poor. Or, I don't see why I have to work this hard. I don't like to dig ditches. I don't like to milk cows. I don't like to have to sit on this lousy tractor breathing in all of this dust that gives me hay fever. See? And I've lived among people all my life that partook of this spirit. I want somebody to give them a handout. 
I was raised on construction camps. That's my background. And it was amazing to, to see the attitude of some of them. Then I'd see another fellow, gee, so grateful for a job, going to save his money, going to go to college. Gee, and I just, my heart would just kind of go out to him. There's a great spirit. He's down here with us driving mules and on a Fresno right along with the rest of us and working for a dollar a day on his board, which we did during the Depression. That's why I earned my money to go on my mission and later to go to school, dollar a day and board. and very grateful for it. And some of them just full of bitterness and others say, oh, I'm so glad I got this job. So I'm going to make it now. I just need a little bit of money. I can get into college. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. Just a difference in spirit. Where are you? What chapter are you in right now? Uh, I'm, uh, well, I'm, I'm talking about, I think, uh, I just made t headline notes here. I think Benjamin 3, I mean, Mosiah 3, 3 and 4. Just taking the highlights of his sermon, actually. Now, um, he says that charity must be in wisdom. If you want the exact reverend, let me turn to it. I don't want to get it to, out of joint here. Let's see. Uh, he says that charity must be in wisdom. Now, it's over a little bit further. Here it is over here. It's uh, chapter 4, and I'm on a verse about um, 27 right now. 27, in which he says that charity must be done in wisdom. Will you remember that? Because some of you are going to be bishops, and your worst difficulty in dealing with people in need is getting them to become worthy poor. Because at least half who will come to you are unworthy. And they got little starving children at home, and... Um, He's kind of a nice guy, really. He, uh, gee, he plays with his children sometimes. He's just some kind of a nice guy. and He just won't go out and earn any money. Or if he does, he just spends all his time talking and yakking away and having a good time, and he gets fired all the time. So you've got a big job on your hands. You've got a half-built human being that's never learned how to work or take responsibility, has married, is an ever-loving, wonderful feller around the house, but he never gets out and earns a living. That's his problem. Then you've got the other kind of a fellow who's just mean, grumpy. He, he's the unworthy poor, too. The reason he can't hold a job is because he's just a miserable human being. He's just a mess to be around. Nobody loves him but his wife, and you wonder about her. Anyway, you've got a problem now. So you, these are the people you have to work with. Now it must be done in wisdom. So the church is now spending much, much more time with its poor, not giving them things, not giving them things, but helping them work out their problems with bare essentials to keep them going and keep them motivated. In other words, the word of the Lord is when a person is in need, there ought to be a little pad there to pick up, the, to, to break the fall, but a very thin one, right? A very thin one for his sake. Otherwise, you corrupt him. You put him on a, a uh, just like some of the people now who are welfare patients. They're unionizing so that they can get more as poor people. That's, that's really something. To unionize and get more as poor people. The whole objective should be to get people out of poverty. What's our ultimate goal? Ultimate goal. No poor. That's our goal. Can you prevent people from being poor if they want to be? The government program says you can. We must prevent them from being poor, whether they like it or not. The Lord says you must never do that. You must always have the rule that the idle, the lazy, and abominable poor shall not eat the fruits of the labor. That's my rule. That's a rule of justice. Don't you corrupt these people. You let them learn the lessons of life and grow up. Now, that's a tough job for a bishop. And it isn't easy to answer. You, I can't give you any general rules. I've had to do this and work uh, in, in the welfare projects. And sometimes we've labored more to get a man to be a man and get up on his feet and try to hold down a job than anything else in our ward. Now, all the people, let's see, afterwards, all the people wanted to make a covenant. And so a census was taken by Benjamin to see how many of them turned out. How many of them actually entered the covenant? Every single person entered the covenant. Now, something I want you to pay attention to. In the very next generation, the children who were there and heard the sermon 
but didn't know enough about what was happening to make the covenant turn out to be real apostate reprobates, including the sons of the new king and the son of the new president. Uh, that'll be Alma, and the sons of the king will be uh, the sons of Mosiah, who are going to go down among the Lamanites on their mission. Now, this is one of the great sermons in all the Book of Mormon, so I haven't spent as much time on it as I should, but I hope that you've sort of uh, read the small print, and I've emphasized, I want you to remember about the abominable poor and the abominable rich and the born-again process, what makes a good king, uh, how you reduce taxes, which Washington hasn't heard about yet, and uh, how you get justice and equity and eliminate jails, and how you, get the, uh, you eliminate immorality and drugs and this sort of thing. And I think I told you how we eliminated it while I was serving as chief of police. I used these principles and they worked in our everyday secular American life. They worked. I told you about that, didn't I? In one of my classes. Okay, now, very quickly, I just want you to remember about Zenif. Now, it was about 200, it was about 200 B.C., we think, when Zenif went down here to settle. And they got down as far as this point here. Then there was a big quarrel because Zenif says these these people are just happy and lazy down there. You don't have to go down and fight those people. Just go down and negotiate. And the leader said, we will fight and kill that Zenith. He's a betrayer. So they had a big civil war. How many survived? Fifty. They went back, got another company with their wives and children this time because they've now seen the land. Zenith is sure they can settle it. They come back down. He negotiates. Does he get the city? Right? They give him two cities. This city is called... Nephi, and this one is called Shalom or Sh Shalom, meaning peace. And the uh, Lamanites moved over to this one, which was Shemlon. Shemlon. Shalom and Shemlon. All right, and they had uh, some years of peace? Yes, 13. And then the Lamanites came in and tried to conquer them. That's what the Lamanite king had in mind all the time. And the Nephites were successful. And they defended themselves very carefully, and then they had 22 years of peace, and then the old king died, and the new and the sun arose, and now we got real problems. Oh, uh, Nephi, Shalom, Shemlon. And in volume three, you have all of this uh, uh, on a map, but uh, for this volume, you have to make your own little map. All right, now, beginning... Tuesday, I'll cover all of the early days, the, uh, the rest of the life of Zenith, and the life of Noah, and the rise of Abinadi, and we're ready for our test. For the scouts? Yes. It's kind of off the subject, but I was reading your, in your thing about the creation. Yes. And I found uh -huh. this part that says, in the pre-existence, we knew many celestial beings that had already been redeemed. Right, on a world I was wondering, I right? heard that Christ was the redeemer for all worlds, but... Oh, no, there's a Redeemer for every family. Is yeah. Oh, yeah. There's a Redeemer for every family. Yeah, but these seem to be children of God. They were more ancient than ours. These beings were redeemed, and Christ cannot have been the only Redeemer yeah, in eternal. Right. And uh, yeah. Brigham Young in another place says, there is a Redeemer for each of the Father's families. And so... So there, there are numerous Redeemers. So these guys here then weren't in our family. They weren't... Oh, there's the, some father's of the fathers, some of the fathers... Like his brothers and sisters. And, mm -hmm. Or some of his children from an earlier family. So we're 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 kind of late in the. We've come way down the trail. There've been many families before us. In fact, when Moses and Abraham both saw them, they couldn't believe how many worlds the Father created, and, and they were already gone through our process and are way on way up ahead. Okay. So we're dealing with a big family of gods here, a real big family.